But if anybody wants to contribute while we go or add something, you're, everyone's welcome. This is not like a scholarly talk or anything like that. You know? <laughs> I am Kyle Creason, and I'm the technology librarian here at the library up in Boone, North Carolina. Um, does anybody know where that is? And in Durham, <laughs> but that's not in the mountains. But. Um, and then lived all over the. It's in the North Carolina mountains. Uh, Boone is a little over a mile high. Oh, wow. What we'll be talking about is more in the um, southwestern North Carolina mountains, which are even higher. Tallest mountain in North Carolina is 6,700 feet, oh. Mount Mitchell. Oh, okay. It's Vermont to shame, huh? These yeah. aren't mountains. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am a flatlander. <laughs> but I don't get mad about it. People I know who get mad about it are from the Rockies. <laughs> and out. Well, I just finished a book about the, the Everest, one of the Everest expeditions. Or there, yeah. So we won't talk about <laughs> We won't talk about the height of mountains. <laughs> They're calling mountains here. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so um, from the North Carolina mountains, and one of the, we'll be, t tonight we'll be talking about see, sort of approaching this subject through three people, three sub like, subjects from that area, Doc Watson, Bascom Lunsford, and Samantha Bumgarner. A lot of people don't know about Samantha, and you'll be excited to learn about her, I think. Um, and I grew up, like, down the road from Doc Watson. So I grew up, he's probably the most famous of these people, and one of the more famous kind of old-timey musicians, even though he didn't want to play old-timey music, but that's part of the story. I didn't know Oh, no. He was into rockabilly. Oh, that's so. funny. Um, but, uh, so I grew up going to, like, fish fries or gathering and stuff, and he'd be playing. So I thought everybody could play like that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, they can't. Um, no one can, <laughs> actually. Um, so... Yes, so I got a, but it was a lot of fun, you know, and it was nice. I lived in California a long time later on, and whenever he would be on tour, I'd always go out and see him because, you know, he rem remembered me. He was a very brilliant person, um, knew so many different things. I used to go when I was in college at Appalachian State for a while. His brother owned a, I guess you would call it a vacuum repair shop. I don't know, that's what he did, but they did other things in there. And Doc would be in there a lot. So I was able to spend time with him. It was really special and nice. But anyway, so that's kind of what, you know, I was, I guess, felt um, that if this isn't cultural appropriation or whatever, right, for me to talk about this stuff. <laughs> and uh, so, yes. So you want to introduce sure, sure. So I'm Steve Lotspeech, and I know uh, many of you. And um, I'm the planning and zoning director for the town of Waterbury, been here for quite a long time. And um, I have some roots in the uh, Southern Appalachians. I'll see if I can be like, a little bit like Kyle here, but no, I'm not. But um, so I'm originally from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, as my <laughs> grandfather would say. And, uh, but I had ancestors, my uh, dad's dad, um, was from eastern Tennessee, sort of on the other side of the Blue Ridge and the Smokies from where Kyle is from. And um, then another branch of my family was from Vermont, from southern Vermont. My great-great-grandfather was from West Townsend, Vermont. Oh, so, uh, that's where my parents are. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so he migrated to Cincinnati to seek his fortune and uh, did pretty well. And uh, so that's where the two families, those two families met, met up. And, um, but then I moved to upstate New York and went to summer camp in Vermont. And that's where I really started discovering um, music. And my brother and sister played folk music. And my parents would take us to see Pete Seeger and Joan Baez and all these great people. But at summer camp, we really had a draw to the music of the south southern Appalachians, Not and to date you, but when was that? that would have been 1963, 
That would be right in that time. Yes. So we would take songs from the Southern Appalachians and we would change the words. So the, my homes across the Blue Ridge Mountain became my homes across the Saldash Mountain because we looked out on Saldash Mountain. We were at the Saldash Mountain camp. And uh, that good old Mountain Dew came, became um, that Saldash Mountain Dew. We'd make root beer. Had a little kick to it because we uh, fermented it in big trash barrels and then bottled it up for our big fair. So, uh, so we had a group, and then we had dances, and um, and then my interest in music evolved, and uh, so that's kind of my route. And um, yeah, so here we are, and I've been enjoying this music, mostly self-taught. Had a lot of great friends. I am also a huge fan of Doc Watson. I first. Saw him at the Philadelphia Folk Festival. That's where I went to high school and um, sat on the grass. He was like from me to Judy or Rachel and, you know, up on a little podium or a little platform. And, you know, I was just like, wow. So I want to play like that. Well, I, you know, how that is. But um, at any rate, um, and many other great musicians that uh, I've had the privilege of um, meeting some of them. and and learning their music. And I also learned a lot from records, and we're going to talk about some of the, these old characters and records and things like that. So uh, a little bit of musicology, but a lot of stories. And uh, so with that, take it away. I also neglected to say, so I'm not a total carpet bagger. My wife grew up here. <laughs> In Underhill. I, I just um. wanted to point out, um, who does that look like? That maybe fellow there. 15 years ago, exactly, maybe. Exactly, doesn't it? <laughs> So, yes. So, there's mountains. So, that's Doc Watson. Um, like I said, we're going to look at this stuff sort of through three people. That's uh, Bascom Lunsford. Has anybody heard of him before? I like his shoes, Kyle. He's fancy. <laughs> and then we're going to learn why he yeah, is fancy. That. that was very, very, very important to him to always look dapper. Dapper. For a specific reason. He, well, we'll get into it about him. And then <laughs> Samantha Bumgarner, um, super amazing person and, and woman that we'll learn a little bit about. Not as well known, of course, but known in certain circles very well. And we'll find out some of the things that she did. There aren't many pictures of her, not a lot of information online. That's why she was said to be an extremely joyous and always laughing woman. <laughs> um, maybe not when people had a camera in her face. Um, I was desperately looking for the smiles. There might be some. Um, so there you were talking about a little bit about, this is what I guess is considered Southern Appalachian Mountains. Um, this is a picture, as you can see, the counties of the Blue Ridge Music Hall of Fame, whatever. And then, sort of where Bascom and these people are from, it's like in here. This area, I mean, the mountains of North Carolina um, for the East Coast are very high. They were very, very thick in growth and all kinds of stuff. So it was like, that was the poorest, most isolated part of America for a long, long time. Also, there are, I think, over like more than 23 Native American tribes in North Carolina. Cherokee were up sort of near this area. Still a lot of them there. But you know the sad story of a lot of why a lot of them are not removed, which is not a happy time. But this place was so kind of like isolated for a long, long time. There was a lot of intermingling between the 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 Europeans who settled there were mostly Anglo Irish, Scots Irish. Like they have a Highland Games um, right out, outside Asheville and, and things like that. Um, so those, that side of tradition of ballads um, was very strong there. And the tradition of Irish ballads is mostly known for without accompaniment and women um, singing them. And so all these people we talk about, their families, their, you know, Doc's mom and these different people knew all the old ballads. A lot of them had been slightly altered. If you've listened to any, there is a l running theme of the, the ladies being done wrong 
and then a ghost getting the guy, or somebody getting the guy. <laughs> um, and I don't think, you know, that was not by mistake. Uh, a lot of the originals were that way, but many more of the ones that had sort of evolved in the, this area um, came to be known. You know, Omi Wise is a super famous. A lot of things um, where these young, innocent ladies were, you know, um, what, lied to and done wrong, and then they got their comeuppance. And so this kind of like, you know, storytelling, um, it's not fantasy world, but like, you know, uh, expression of, these things haven't, but expression of kind of what you would like to be able to do or just to, you know, sing the song, saying this could happen to you. Is that, you know, it's a very important thing, I think, to people. And so, we were going to do, you want to do the first? Oh, Groundhog? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. So this is a song, <clears throat> you know, um, hopefully that started, or talk yeah. about the Yeah, yeah, I could talk a little bit about it, if you like. So, um, this is, uh, this is one of uh, my favorite songs that um, I learned from the playing of uh, Doc Watson. And um, so in the uh, Southern Appalachians, the, the woodchuck is groundhog, and it's also called a whistle pig because you may have heard woodchucks whistle when they're, um, you know, alarming or That's something. That's what I knew it as. Whistle pig. Whistle pigs. Yeah. So, uh, and we're going to talk about the whistle pig banjo here in a little while. So uh, that's got to They're everywhere down there. Yeah. So, um, but this is not a whistle pig banjo. It does have a skin head on it, so it's a little temperamental, but it's in tune, so that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, we won't go into the, any of the jokes right now about banjos, but so, uh, so this is one of the tunings that's um, popular in that part of um, the world. And, um, it's a modal tuning, and um, so it gives you kind of that high lonesome sound, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, which really got popularized with bluegrass, but really or, uh, had its origin in, in old-time country music. So, so this is uh, O Groundhog, all right. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finger pick this one, and then the, the, other, the other songs are going to be claw hammer or frailing style. So you get a few different uh, styles, a couple different styles here. Oh, shoulder up a gun and whistle off a dog. Shoulder up a gun and whistle off a dog. We're off to the backwoods to catch a groundhog. Little piece of cornbread laying. 
laying on the shelf. A little piece of cornbread's laying on the shelf. If you want any more, you'll have to sing it yourself. Oh, Groundhog. <laughs> Thank you. So, so I'll just talk a little bit about Doc Watson, just because that's kind of my entry into this, and then I think probably most of the people up here and just in general these days um, know a lot of this music through him and back. Um, but it's hard to imagine a time when Doc's sort of guitar and Appalachian roots weren't part of the American musical fabric. Um, so many people were inspired by him and, and turned on to him back, especially during the folk revival, which, you know, when you were saying you saw him, mm -hmm. um, 63, which there was an initial kind of discovery of this music in the 30s. This one is, it happened again with the college students and things in the early 60s. And um, we'll kind of look at Doc through the lens of that when him and his father-in-law, um, Gaither uh, Carlton, came off the mountain to New York City. They're um, invited to New York City to, to give some concerts. Um, there's Doc Super Young. He was blind his whole life. Wasn't born blind. He had, uh, well, I can't remember, like he got a bad flu or something, and it made him blind when he was two. <laughs> Remember? So it was, you know, hard to figure out, you know, he, he farmed and did all these things, but um, it's hard to possibly to, you know, excel at that. And, um, you know, didn't know, he was sent off to the school of the blind for a little while and, and didn't really like it and was homesick. So came back home. That wasn't up near where he was from. Um, but his father in law, Gaither Carlton, was a great fiddle player. Now, not great in the sense of like famous or known anywhere else outside of those areas, but you know, he was really good. Um, and so Doc grew up in that tradition. His mom, I can show you here. So that was an album that uh, was recorded, I think it was Ralph Rensler's going through that area looking for musicians and things and so they they record they recorded at his house um and it's a really awesome album it didn't get released till later so this wasn't part of that in influential time of what happened with the um, folk revival and things but his mom sings these like super beautiful really high kind of lonesome ballads about you know often men and um <laughs> <laughs> um and then his brothers in here and Doc and, and Gaither and, and all this um, kind of thing. But one of the interesting things about the, this music and why, you know, this kind of magical thing happened in terms of this music sprouting from this area was that Scots-Irish balladry, um, European instrumentation, but of course the banjos from West Africa. And so a lot, so, just reading things from my own interest and in, you know reading things for this and things Mo so many of the the musicians who ended up being very influential and in changing things uh from that area especially were kind of uh troublemakers i guess you'd say <laughs> and noise sneaking away and wanting to go see what was going on in the sh you know shack way over there where it seemed like they're having a hell of a lot more fun than over there <laughs> at his house and th this is you know most of them sneak away and, and the first time they saw a banjo, not Doc because he's older, but back in say the 20s and 30s, were uh, African American black musicians, who some of them were lost to history and some were not, but like people like Doc Boggs and these people said, you know, I learned the instrument from my dad, and he was doing a thing that was all right. I didn't want to play like him, and I saw this guy and you know changed music and was sort of and so all these things coming together same thing with uh the cherokee and native american people like a lot of these people when you're so poor like that there's so much kind of overlap that there were things within that that were very influential 
but what became part of old time music banjo was using these instruments and the percussiveness of it, and you know, sort of these African rhythms and stuff, um, and it you know created this you know ultimately through all these evolutionary steps created this kind of music, which couldn't have happened without all these different type of people in this isolated place. This is Doc and Gaither Carlton. Um, I don't know if that's their place or who knows. Um, this was when they were initially going around and uh, Ralph Rensler, I think it was, were going around and just capturing. He didn't know what he was going to release and just capturing things. This was not, this was not released, um, I don't think, until somewhat recently. Um, it was lost and then it was found. But um, Doc says about this specific thing, um, They came to record these old, more old-timer type guys, Clarence Ashley, um, Gaither Carlton, and Doc was just there. He tried out to see if like, maybe he was good enough to like, maybe have a record or who knows what, but he only wanted to play rockabilly and rock and roll and stuff. Like, he didn't think any, he didn't understand why anyone would listen to the old stuff. Um, so that's what he initially played and tried to play on his electric guitar and stuff like that. Like he thought, you know, he wanted to be like, who, you know, the Rockabilly guys. Eventually, well, Gaither said that Doc knows this stuff. He's a better player than me and all this, but Doc, you know, once again was like, you know, just didn't, you know, which happens all the time, didn't think that people outside of there would be interested. And when he played, he got very excited. Um, and then ultimately invited Doc and Gaither Carlton to come up to New York uh, to perform at the NYU School of Education and at a club called Blind Lemons, which closed the week after Doc and them were there. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the first time, my, my understanding, that they came down and like and the new generation of people kind of heard this music again. Because um, they, you know, the young people I don't think we're as interested in the real old guys. I don't know, but um, I wasn't around then. But my understanding is that Doc and Gaither came, and it was almost like a like a um, historical, ethno, uh, anthropological kind of act, maybe you know, to play at this NYU School of Education and sort of that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if they knew. Doc certainly didn't know. He was in shock but that there was this kind of a world of city kids who were looking for kind of the root, you know, the roots of things. So that's what he gave them. But, you know, the stories that I had heard, read about and heard um, was that he was kind of amazed that these like people from New York City who have all this stuff wants to listen to this stuff, you know, but uh, it worked out for him um, over time. And so at that, those two concerts was a guy um, named Peter Siegel, who was 18 years old. This guy, Peter Siegel, ended up um, founding the Non-Such Explorer series, became head of A&R at Polydor, and like produced all these famous records. But he was 18 at the time, and uh, he actually recorded these two shows. Um, I don't think they were planning on recording them otherwise, but he you know, had that vision, I guess, of capturing this stuff. And he said uh, in an interview today, there are all these great flat picking guitarists that we know about, Clarence White, Tony Rice, and all kinds of people, Billy Strings now, super famous. But at that time, nobody outside of the Southern Appalachians had ever heard a folk guitar play like that. Like it was a new, supposedly new thing. Um, in folk music, the guitar was always an accompanying instrument, which was usually strummed in a certain type of way. So when Doc Watson showed up and played it in his way, do you have a way of, what would you describe it that was maybe a little different? In the well, way he, was, he was playing fiddle tunes on the guitar. Right. And um, just... And he's so fast and just... Yeah, just uh, bringing it to life. Yep. Bringing it to life. And like if you listen to him, it's so clear. And it sounds like it's more than one instrument. 
And I said, like, yeah, like a fiddle, but it's guitar playing and these kind of things. So it wasn't just sort of strumming, like filling it out and keeping time and things. And so these are some pictures, some more pictures that they got during that time at it, um, their house. That's Clarence Ashley. Clarence Ashley. We're going to do Ashley. one of his songs. I mean, in a few yeah, going to do one of his songs. But he taught them and played with them a lot there. Um, this is them with uh, Doc's brother, Arnold. This is a record that came out probably, in, I think, not 63, 64 maybe, yep. which was, I think, it, yep. that was really influential probably at that yeah, time, okay. right? Something kind of thing. These two records, I learned a lot of them. Uh-huh. Um, let's see. I'm sorry. That's closer up of them. And then you have another song that you want to go into. So yeah. this is a whistle pig banjo. That's what they look like, sort of. They're a little bit different because the skins, I guess, are not as big, right? So, yep. uh, yeah. and he got a whistle pig banjo. Right there, it's my first banjo. Yeah. I uh, studied at a place called the John C. Campbell Folk School in Brasstown, North Carolina. I still was studying blacksmithing, so I used to work as a, like a blacksmith, but not a farrier. Like, it was a revival of that. This, John C. Campbell Folk School kind of brought back this artisan, artist, blacksmithing type thing. So I went there, apprenticed to a number of people, and um, would make like these little pieces that would go on the gates in the, like at Colonial Williamsburg. And then all these rich people started getting like these gates where I would help these, these older guys who were making it, like they'd make like raccoons and all kinds of cool stuff out of like, you know, iron, um, forge welding and stuff like that. But anyway, um, so John C. Campbell Folk School is a place where that was keeping this kind of culture alive and everything like that. And they had classes. That's the first, well, I'd seen them before, but I didn't know what they were. But I made a, um, a whistle pig banjo there. And there's a couple guys I made friends with who were sort of doing that. And it's kind of cool. But they're kind of keeping that old sort of culture alive. Yeah. And he has one. So here it is. <laughs> so this is my whistle pig banjo. And the reason it's called a whistle pig banjo is because uh, this is a groundhog or um, whistle pig hide. And it stretched over a piece of a coffee can. Oh, so if, if I were to take the back off the banjo, you'd see the coffee can in there with the, uh, the hide on it. And uh, this banjo I got in uh, about 1968. So it's uh, not quite as old. And the song you're doing is the cuckoo bird. This is a cuckoo bird. So this is a um, Clarence Tom Ashley song, or one he popularized. Um, and um, so this is, goes more on the gambling uh, side of things. Um, so it's a little more. And I'll say, well, yeah, this is from the Harry Smith's anthology of uh, American folk music, which was a very influential uh, series of records that came out in the early mid 50s, I think. I have it, but it, not from then. Like, um, super cool, but this was kind of the Bible of a lot of the people who then got really into this music that was released back there. But anyway, this is sort of how the little, you know, cards or the print looked for the different songs. So this is the one for Cuckoo Bird that he's performing here. Yeah. So this is a fretless banjo. So you'll see it's more like a fiddle, violin, or, um, you know, other uh, fretless type instrument. And um, so Kyle mentioned that the uh, banjo came from West Africa with the slave, the people who were enslaved um, in this country, and um, the originally it was probably a gourd with a, a neck and um, and maybe two or three or four strings. So the Scotch Irish added the fifth string here, so hence the five string banjo uh, as a drone. So you know they liked the drone sound of the um, you know the um, pipes, right? Uh, bagpipes. So that and was remember added. the fifth string, because when we talk about lovely Aunt Samantha, yeah, that'll come back. That'll come back. So, so this is um, this is the cuckoo, and there's different versions of this, but this is the uh, Clarence Tom Ashley version. So. She's a pretty bird. She wore gold as 
she flies and she never hollers cuckoo till the fourth day of July. Jack of Diamonds, Jack of Diamonds, I've known you. A little bit finally about Doc Watson, I'll just read something that um, this kid, the guy who was an 18 year old at these two concerts in New York City that happened and what he said about them. He said that those two concerts and the recordings that were made happened at a particular time in Doc's career in sort of America's change when Doc and we were just finding out that people actually like to hear the old time music. You know, he and, the, and some of the the, the guys he played with, they just didn't believe it. A transformation in American culture was happening, and a growing number of city kids were looking to find the roots of American music. Doc had been living it and went on to become an almost impossible bridge that we couldn't believe between the old and the new. And sort of, that's kind of what he represented there. So that was in 62. Now we're going to go back 40 years and learn, I'll talk a little bit about um, Bascom Lunsford, because well, he was someone who, um, his dad was a teacher. He grew up in that area, and he knew lots and lots of people. Um, he also had this very special gift or vision for maybe understanding the, what was happening. There was a, you know, there was a lot of changes in the 20s, even teens, 20s in America. Um, and so he's an interesting person regarding this stuff because his first music collecting trips, when he started really being interested in capturing it, because he could see that it was going to be overrun and sort of basically go away eventually, um, he started... Now, he didn't have any resources or any ways to do anything, so he used to go around on horseback and write them down. Like, he didn't have recording or anything like that, but he, was, he would go out and collect stories, ballads, and these kind of things. Within his life, right, so he used to go around to the hills and stuff and record that way. His life was such 
and you'll learn why he kind of got well known um, over time. But that was, you know, in the, the early 20s. And by 1939, he was performing at the White House for uh, President uh, Roosevelt. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt really liked him a lot. And the King and Queen of England. And in 49, he was the American representative at the International Folk Festival in Venice, right? So he like sort of could probably never imagine getting to Italy and all these things at that, you know, but then, you know, 25 years later or something, you know, there he was, the center of a lot of this stuff, which is kind of interesting. Um, his father being a teacher was, you know, important part of that because his father was interested in the old stories, old ballads and things like that, and his dad gave him a, a, a fiddle. Um, one of the things about... Um, Bascom Lunsford, you can't find a picture of him when he's not like what they call clean. <laughs> I grew up on clean. Uh, even in Turkey Creek. I don't know where he got the suit, probably wasn't in Turkey Creek, but uh, he was because he had a certain reason for always presenting this way. And whenever um, he put on folk festivals and all this stuff, he found it very important for the people in them who are from that region to present themselves that way. Um, does anybody have a guess as to why? Uh, he was in, did not like all the stereotypes about his people in popular culture, the hillbillies and, and the way all that was, because he knew it was ridiculous and hurtful. And so he found, like I said, um, he started giving lectures and performances on North Carolina folklore, poetry, and songs. And this is way before even the people came down from um, Columbia University and stuff to find him. The late teens. Um, he was born in 1882, so it was even probably in the like 1908s and stuff. Um, he always appeared in a finely pressed suit, white tie, tails, and a banjo in hand because he found it important to demonstrate the worth and dignity he saw in the place and the people. And this was the harbinger of his lifelong battle against insulting stereotypes of mountain society and culture and the demeaning portrayal of hillbillies, you know, in popular culture, like I said. So that's why, you know, he was going around like this. Um, he didn't grow up with a lot of money. He ended up going to uh, getting in Trinity College, which became Duke. Um, and getting a law degree, but he didn't become a lawyer. Um, he like was a honey farmer or something like that. But I, don't, but I, think, I think these were excuses to um, do this stuff. And you know, so he was really a people person. And so he would go out and just walk for, my understanding, months and stay in people's houses just all over the hills recording this stuff. And there's a number of uh, like novels based on, sort of based on that idea and some of this kind of stuff. Um, but like the, the wandering, not preacher then, that's what was before, but the wandering sort of story collector, ballad collector, song collector. Um, in 1924, a guy from Atlanta, Polk Brockman, um, came and was looking to make a record with somebody, and he uh, recorded Bascom uh, singing a song, Jesse James, and I Wish I Was a Mole in the Ground, which we'll do a little later. Um, and then as it was discovered that he was out collecting these things and people started getting a little bit to know about it a little more, um, Robert Winslow Gordon, a writer and collector who later went on to found the Archive of Folk Song at the Library of Congress, uh, came down and I guess met him. Um, and that really gave Bascom Lunsford a lot more belief in what he was doing and, and that there was something that he could do with it. And so in 1927, he founded what is considered the first folk festival in Asheville. Here he is playing when he was younger with some people. He's always fancy. So this is a, from the brochure, 
this is deep research. So, um, <laughs> then one of the first brochures, I don't, I don't think they had them in the, for the first festivals, but this is like early 30s. It was called the Mountain Dance, Mountain Dance and Folk Festival. It was in Nashville, North Carolina. Um, you will enjoy a visit to the land of the sky. So obviously there's some marketing behind it. That's probably why I was allowed to do it, and they gave him this place. Um, this is really cool. So I found this late in one internet research thing. This was the way he would send out to people to invite them. This is a, like a, a trifold brochure thing. So about sundown the first week of August, you know, would be that. Um, and this is just bigger, that's like the sort of stamp, the annual mountain dance and folk festival. So as you guys know, like folk festivals exploded later on and it's just amazing. They might have had them in Europe, I don't know. I mean, so I always say it's the first folk festival in America, North America. This was on the inside of the front cover, the mountain ballad country wherein lives the tradition of the dancing and music which the people bring each year to the famous Asheville Folk Festival. And so you can see the map of where all this stuff happened. Asheville. Um, this is like, it's, you know, I guess it's marketing copy for the time, but it's much more poetic than you would probably get now. Now it'd be like, you know, five words or something. <laughs> but, um, but that's sort of some of it. I'm trying to get to the music and all well, that. So, but anyway, this was a really beautiful, you know, kind of thing. I thought it was amazing. Um, so now, what do we do? You want to do um, just the, the instrumental? Yeah. Yes. So Steve's going to play some instrum instrumental music, and I'm just going to slowly go through a few of these pictures I found. So a lot of these pictures I found um, in the Library of Congress digital collection. A lot of them were taken by Alan Lomax in the early 30s, which is an extra kind of interesting thing. He was someone who came down and got turned on to it and was super, you know, excited about all this stuff and, um, you know, came down and, yeah, documented a lot of these, the festivals. Yeah, so um, I thought it'd be fun just to play a, a few fiddle tunes on the banjo and um, it's one of my favorite things to do with the banjo, and you'll probably recognize uh, these tunes. So some of them came over from um, Scotland and Ireland, and um, some of them were written here and became a real blend. And um, so for those of you who have, uh, how many of you have square danced or contra danced? Probably a bunch of you, great. So um, you know the uh, fiddle tunes are geared around dances and, um, you know, the 16 bars that corresponded to um, the pattern of the dance. So uh, and the A part and the B part and so on. So, uh, so the first one I'll do is um, not exactly from this area, but it's Arkansas Traveler, which is a familiar one. And then um, Soldier's Joy, which is one that came over from, from Europe. And then the last one is uh, Whiskey Before Breakfast, and when I play this for kids, I, I sing it as juice before breakfast because <laughs> I don't want to advocate that. That's not great either. Yeah. <laughs> but who knows? So, uh, so there's, a, there's a whole story with the Arkansas Traveler about the, the lost traveler and, you know, how do you get from here to Stowe? And, well, you know, you can't Those get there from here. Those are the Longwood sisters. Okay. Good. So uh, Arkansas Traveler. <laughs> the story of the Arkansas Traveler is that the Arkansas Traveler was, um, was touring around and uh, there was an old guy on the porch uh, playing this fiddle tune and he only knew that one part. And he just played over and over and over again. It was really boring. And so the Arkansas um, Traveler said, hey, you know, there's a B part to that song. And <laughs> the old guy said, oh, <laughs> I didn't know that. So he said, here, give me your fiddle and I'll play you the B part. So.
So when, the fiddle, when you play with a fiddle player, of course, <laughs> they want to play it really fast. So uh, that, I thought it would give you a little bit of a flavor. So here's Soldier's Joy. There are words to this, but I've never, never learned them. Uh, Clawhammer style banjo, and the story is that there was someone who had a deformed hand that was, you know, clenched like that, had a, a disability or differently abled, and and uh, invented the style of playing the banjo. So that's how it came to be called Clawhammer style, but it's also called frailing, and uh, also called uh, double thumbing while you're frailing. And that's what Pete Seeger was never able to learn from his brother Mike. But uh, <laughs> anyway. I was going to say, no, I'm not going to say Pete. One of the things I found in multiple sources is that uh, Brad Kerlinski did Pete Seeger's first banjo. Yeah, could very well be. Yeah, so whiskey before breakfast. So. <laughs> So I guess a song that became kind of the standard or the, the um, most known song, bluegrass song sort of back in the day or old timey song was um, Good Old Mountain Dew. Bascom Lunsford wrote that, never got a dime. Pepsi made a lot of money with the Mountain Dew, the name. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, he wrote that song, that's super well famous. Do you want to go into uh, Mole in the Ground? Sure. Sure. If, you're, if your Absolutely. fingers are... Yeah. Um, this is the original, okay. Yeah, so this is a uh, Bascom Lums Lumsford. Lumsford or Lunsford? Lunsford. Lunsford, okay. Okay, thank you for correcting me. 
Lamar was his middle name. So I don't think he had a tuner for his banjo. <laughs> he probably had a better, good ear, better than, ear than me. As we said, didn't. There, that's good. All right, so this is Mall on the Ground, and um, this is the traditional version. Here's the record, the original. I think so. I think uh, so, um, but I really I enjoy doing this with kids, and I with kids I do it as a zipper song where I uh, zip in one animal and zip in another, and then I ask them what their favorite animal is, and they uh, you know they tell me, and then I'll make up a verse on the fly. So, uh, but this is more the traditional one, which um, there are a lot of songs um, <clears throat> about. Um, People, men typically who are arrested, and um, this is a one, and we'll do uh, Worried Man Blues uh, a little later, which is another one about someone who ends up on the chain, on the chain gang. So uh, this song is also about um, a couple and a uh, man who ends up um, ending up in the pen. So and all the you know issues around that. Diggy 
So I'm going to try to go quickly into Samantha Bumgarner here because she's probably maybe a little less well known, but uh, I think will be potentially the most appreciated in the room. Um, one thing that I don't know if a lot of people know that um, women were quite often the most prevalent banjo players back, then, back in the old days. For example, uh, Ralph Stanley learned to play banjo from his mom, Lucy Smith Stanley. Clarence Ashley learned from his aunts, Earl Scruggs, never played a banjo until uh, his sisters, Eula May and Ruby, were, he knows they were really good at it and it made him want to learn. So it was, it's a kind of thing. So Samantha um, Bumgarner is from that area from Dillsboro, North Carolina, which is near Sil um, Silva, which is small too. It's near Western Carolina University, sort of. Um, she was the first person ever recorded playing a five string banjo. Um, and they consider the possibly what they would call the first country music recordings. And um, that's what a lot of like people say. Um, Bascom Lunsford was a huge supporter of her and would always want her to play. She taught a lot of the people who ended up becoming famous uh, banjo players, and she played fiddle and all of it. But a lot of the people who came up and became well known from getting discovered discovered. Um, she had a hand in a fair bit of that. Um, she was known as the fiddling ballad woman of the, of the mountains. Her uh, maiden name was Samantha Biddix and her dad was a fiddle player named Ham Biddix. Um, I'm going to read a little couple of things she said. Like it's hard to find a lot of things but I did find a really f interesting uh, interview with her. So I thought it would do that. Let me show a couple more pictures. So this is Samantha Bumgarner and Eva Davis. They are the ones who made these recordings. They went, to, they got invited and went to New York City, and uh, recorded ten songs. One of the interesting things about that day, though, um, is that in the morning, Samantha Bumgarner and Eva Davis were there cutting what became sort of known as the first sort of banjo or string mu music records ever. And then in the afternoon, Bessie and Clara Smith came by and recorded some of the most famous blues records ever made. Um, so there was a lot of powerful women. What year was that? Um, it was, the day was April 23rd, 1924. Wow. At Columbia, rec well, it wasn't records probably, but the Columbia re Recording Studio in New York. Um, so that must have been something. Um, so about her, when she started playing music, she said, I taught myself to play the banjo on an instrument that was a gourd with a cat's hide stretched over it and strings of cotton thread coated with beeswax. So they used to make those um, out of the African tradition probably, or you know, they had gourds around, but that's probably where people had seen them. So that was like they'd call them the 10 cent banjo. Um, so a lot of people started with that. And I, she didn't say who made it, but it was that kind of thing. She said, the first contest I ever entered was in Canton, which is right outside Asheville. If you've ever been there, it stinks because there's a paper mill. Mm -hmm. So that's what Canton's famous for, huh? Uh, probably might not have been there. Where they were having a fiddler's convention. Somebody entered me, um, and she was a, a child, I think, like a 11 or 12 maybe. Said somebody entered me in the contest. It was the first banjo contest I was ever in, and I was nervous. I knew I couldn't hit a string. Besides, I had that old 10 cent gourd banjo. And here I looked up and saw all these fine banjos coming up from Asheville, which was the big city. You know. I wanted to leave, but they wouldn't let me go. I was trying to get out of there. I tell you, I was so nervous. Um, I didn't know I was hitting the strings, but I won that contest, and I've been winning them ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was, you know. Um, and she was, you know, so it's that kind of thing. Um, they say that she used to rather play fiddle than eat. And the other thing she had passion for was like the old timey stories and sort of mountain kind of stories. So she was a really sort of brilliant, well known songwriter um, where she would weave the two, you know, get those stories in. And so a lot of the sort of um, those sort of what became classical 
songs in the tradition were written by her. She was at Bascom Lunsford's first uh, festival, Mountain Dance and Folk Festival in 27. Um, here's another Pete Seeger. I know if you like Pete Seeger in this. Supposedly, I found this in two places, so I don't know. <laughs> Folk singer icon Pete Singer credited Samantha Bumgarner as his inspiration for playing the five string banjo, saying that he learned the instrument after first hearing one played at the festival but by what he called a mountain girl named Samantha Bumgarner. He said, upon arriving at that festival, I strolled up to the stage and saw a woman in a rocking chair plucking a banjo with a big smile on her face. She played the five string banjo with such skill that I couldn't believe it. And so I guess he, I guess maybe got a lesson from um, Baskin Lunsford or something, I'm not exactly sure, but I thought that was interesting. Anyway, so appearing at the festivals, she got a little bit of known and that record actually did a pretty decent, I guess. So there was a guy who got rich. Um, he was a sort of a snake oil salesman um, who sold goat bladders for erectile dysfunction um, and got rich or something. <laughs> Named, oh, I forgot his name, but I don't what think I put it in there. Huh? What did they do with the bladders? Probably put it where the dysfunction was. Because <laughs> uh, I don't know where else you're going to put it. <laughs> um, so anyway, he invited her to come. He, so he had to get out of the East Coast, apparently, from tax, some of the taxes. Ended up in Del Rio, Texas, where he bought a border radio station called XERA. And he wanted Samantha Bumgarner to come down there really bad. So this, back then, and I guess this one, the, the uh, radio station was, uh, the, it was so powerful, the broadcasting, 500,000 watts, that they could actually hear it back up in the North Carolina mountains, I guess. So people would sit around and listen to their banjo picking ballad woman um, all the time. But anyway, she played at uh, Bascom's Festival and up until 1959, so like 30 years or so. She was the one that Bascom Lunsford wanted to bring with him the work the most, and he did when he played when they played for uh, President uh, Roosevelt and the King and Queen and all that. So she was pretty well known, but then she went back to North Carolina and didn't get out much. But she, it became like a sort of a pilgrimage place for musicians to come down there and meet her and have a lesson with her and stuff like that. This is a, one of the songs from that first recording session. Um, Cindy in the Meadows, I think that's the first song. So that's considered the first five string banjo song or first like any of, of this, all this kind of music recorded, I guess. Mm. What they said. Um, let's see. Big Eyed Rabbit. Eva Davis, she went with her and played here, but then she stopped playing. So she didn't, I mean, she probably kept playing, but she was not, didn't appear on any more records or anything like that. Samantha Bumgarner appeared on like the anthology, the Harry Smith's anthology of folk music and, and some of these things that got well known. Um, while Bill Jones was another, that's just Eva Davis. This is like the kind of stuff that would come out. Um, this was, I think, with those records. Um, and so they had a little bit of a tour and stuff. And so she uh, got decently known, which, like I said, you know, got her mixed up with this goat guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if they're paying, you got to take... Um, so in the, this book, Finding Her Voice, The Illustrated History of Woman in Country Music, um, Mary Buffwack and Robert Orman wrote, of all the female pickers of the 20s, the one with, with, who has the strongest link between Appalachian folk music and what became the commercial country music scene was Samantha Bumgarner. And let's see, Bascom Lunsford called her the best all-around musician that I ever met. So that says a lot. Um, here she is again. She's smiling there. She's smiling there. <laughs> she is smiling. Got a lot of instruments there. And the worried blues, yep. worried man blues is what yep. you're going to play, yep. which we're not 100% sure if that's this, but we're going to say it is. <laughs> For our purposes. Yes. So, Sorry, uh, I didn't mean to surprise you there. No, fine. No, no, no. I just got to keep sitting on my feet. Uh, dodge all of the obstacles. This is the last song, too, because yeah, I know what's getting up there. Last one. So, um, 
as I mentioned, um, I was privileged to get uh, to go to concerts with my family and hear um, Pete Seeger and one of the um, groups that um, that I heard was the Kingston Trio. My brother was a huge Kingston Trio fan. So I actually learned the Kingston Trio version of this song, which is probably the one that really got popular, but I think it dates back to Samantha and um, her song, Worried Man with the Blues. I'm pretty sure this was the original, that original recording, but it's probably... Yeah, so I think it evolved, but I think the theme of um, these lyrics goes back to that time, which um, is about someone who gets arrested and ends up on the chain gang, uh, which was all too common for both uh, black and white men, um, and, um, you know, they'd be, you know, hard labor for, in this case, 21 years, so uh, building railroad. So at any rate, this is Worried Man Blues. a worried, worried man to sing a worried song. It takes a worried man to sing a worried song. I'm worried now, but I won't be worried long. I went across the river and I lay down to sleep. Oh, I went across the river, I lay down to sleep. Went across the river and I lay down to sleep. When I awoke, Shackles on my feet. Oh, it takes a worried man to sing a worried song. Oh, it takes a worried, worried man to sing a worried song. It takes a worried man to sing a worried song. I'm worried now, but I won't be worried long. The shackles on my feet had 21 lengths of chain. Oh, the tackles on my feet had 21 lengths of chain. Shackles on my feet had 21 lengths of chain. And on each link was initials of my name. Well, I asked the judge, tell me what's going to be my fine. Oh, I asked the judge, tell me what's going to be my fine. I asked that judge, tell me what's going to be my fine 21 years on the Rocky Mountain line. Well, it takes a worried man to sing a worried song. Oh, it takes a worried, worried man to sing a worried song. It takes a worried man to sing a worried song. I'm worried now, but I won't be worried long. To the station, 21 coaches long. Oh, the train came to the station, 21 coaches long. Train came to the station, 21 coaches long. What I love is on that train and gone. I looked down the track as far as I could see. Oh, I went down the track as far as I could see. I looked down that track, oh, as far as I could see, little bitty hand was waving after me. It takes a worried man to sing a worried song. Oh, it takes a worried, worried man to sing a worried song. It takes a worried man to sing a worried song. I'm worried now, but I won't be worried long. Should ask you who made up the song. Oh, if anyone should ask you who made up the song, if anyone should ask you who made up the song, tell me it was me. I sing it all day long. It takes a worried man to sing a worried song. Oh, it takes a worried, worried man to sing a worried song. It takes a worried man. Sing a worried song, I'm worried now, but I won't be worried long. So the last little bit I'll do is I'm going to read something that 
from the interview that I read on the Samantha Bumgarner, and I think it sort of is appropriate here in Vermont. I think sort of the sentiment she gives sort of is part of what people come up to Vermont looking for and have here. So she said, uh, I always know when fall is coming into these mountains, I see the early morning tendrils of wood smoke reaching from the neighbor's chimney and smell that aroma that assures a warm, comforting hearth. In the next hollow, they are harvesting the sorghum cane to make that dark, rich molasses which will drip off a cathead biscuit on another crisp fall morning. Fall is always the time for celebrating the end of harvest. The cans are full, the tobacco is hung in the barn, and I get called to play many a hoedown these days. Summer's long, hot days give way to the crisp, fragrant, fragrant fall and the notion of readying for a hard winter. The black squirrels have been seen in these mountains for the first time in a long time, and folks are stacking wood and getting ready for the snow that is bound to come. Fall also is the time when many of our country churches celebrate homecoming Sundays. Mama, soon will Mama Sue will have her stack up filled with corn, green beans, and okra all from her garden. Aunt June will have her big pot of chicken and dumplings, and there will be puddings and pies aplenty. Dinner will be spread out on the church lawn under the big oak trees. After a couple of cool glasses of freshly brewed tea, the singers will adjourn to the choir loft to sing the old shape note hymns from the Christian yeah. ha harmony. My favorite is that old song, French Broad, Higher over, over the Hills, the Mountain Rise. Their summits tower towards the skies. I can still hear the high tenor pushing up toward our high mountains. And so, ultimately, all this stuff is really about that, like family, you know, locale, sort of this kind of thing. And everything that reached out to the broader world was a product of the, you know, authenticity and the realness of that. And that's what I think people were looking to find. And they looked for this kind of music and stories and stuff. So, and it's sort of captured in that. And that's her. She's on this record. Did not pay Bascom Lunford for that. Good old Mountain Dew. I don't know. He. I read something. I couldn't find it again. Where he was not. He was kind of a perturbed. About that. <laughs> um, and that's her grave. It's in uh, Dillsboro. And this is just a picture I found. That looks like the biggest uh, whistle pig banjo I've ever seen. <laughs> it is, and I just like her. That was a big round of <laughs> If that was a round of I don't know what it was. But she looks like she's having fun. But that ain't Samantha Bumgarner, but um, I think she's some, it was a neighbor of hers. <laughs> so I think that's it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> If anybody has any questions or anything they want to share, of course you can. Who is that gentleman that looks a little like Sam Clemens that was sitting with... Uh, Way back here? I know who you're talking about. Scott. This... The next, yeah, this guy. Bill Henley, maybe? Hensley? Hensley? I don't know for sure. I have no notes to the pictures, but... Um, he was in one of the other pictures. He was one of the other pictures. I think that is Fiddlin' Bill... Oh man, Hensley, uh, I think that could be him too. Oh. He's in a lot of these pictures. I think that's him too, uh, maybe a little older. Fiddlin' Bill Hendley, I think. But I'm not 100% sure. Fortunately, we're not, you won't be tested. <laughs> but, uh, yes. Well, in the South, uh, I think Zydeco or like French Cajun music, which uh, um, French Canadian music has some uh, similar bits. I don't know if French Canadian fiddle music and stuff has as much of the African influence, but certainly Zydeco and a lot of the stuff coming out of New Orleans. Uh, I think this old timey music is sort of super famous partly because of like country music comes out of it. Bluegrass music, 
Um, even in that similar area, uh, Piedmont blues is a type of blues that comes out of it and things. Um, you know, and it's a fairly big area. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, that that aspect of how isolated they were for so long, I mean, it was, by, it was the poorest place in this country for so long. Mm -hmm. And so they just didn't get out. I mean, it was ending when I was growing up, but there was a saying like the only way out was cars and guitars. <laughs> NASCAR, like, because uh, NASCAR racing or stock car racing uh, developed in that area. Uh, originally um, from the moonshiners, bootleggers, um, to, to souped up their cars so they could, you know, get away from the feds. And then um, they needed something to do with these things. So they started driving them around, you know, in, a, uh, the, in the red clay uh, ovals. And so one of the first, I, um, I lived in the Piedmont of North Carolina for a long time too. And there was this place we used to go um, in high school and stuff, which was one of the first uh, race car tracks that was carved in the woods. It was just red clay oval and it had sort of overgrown, but there were some places you could get to that were hard to find. Um, but that kind of thing. So that's why it's sort of like, Cars and guitars, <laughs> where, the, where was your shot? Um, of course, that changed somewhat and stuff. But, uh, you should give a talk on DEDs on Sunday Road. Right. <laughs> yeah. I grew up, I always thought it was stupid to just drive around left constantly. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I grew I mean, it's very big there. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's some crazy wrecks and stuff, but you know, I yeah. just, but, but, it, but, but I always loved the, the old stuff, like, you know, like there's all these, the, the original stock car racers, 40s, 50s, were crazy. Like one guy drove backwards in the first Daytona 500 with a monkey in his car. <laughs> <laughs> like, they were wild people. Because, <laughs> you know, it's dangerous. Like it still is, but back then it was very dangerous. And so there's all the, I actually wrote a, I worked in Hollywood for a while, I wrote a screenplay of, uh, Dealing with that a little bit did not get produced or bought, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that another answer to your question, um, Vermont certainly had uh, has a folk tradition, and uh, I went to Goddard College, and we would go to contra dances at my advisor's house and dance in his. Uh, it was like the old kitchen junket in the Southern Appalachians, and uh, we would contra dance and square dance in the house, and I think that was part of a big tradition in Vermont of, um, of dancing, and um, it was more the British Isles tradition here, um, less of the influence of uh, Afro-American and Native American culture to some extent, but even though there were Native Americans here, of course, but... Um, that was the social outlet. That was where you met, right. hopefully, your, you know, person yeah. be your spouse, Future all of it. Partner. There yeah. wasn't, you know, rock show to go to or... A rave or something. Yeah. That was the original raves. <laughs> but, so, Jill, you had a question? How big was Shape Note when you were growing up or in that area? They did it. There were churches that did it. I found it, you know. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I love it now. <laughs> but I knew about it. Like, my grandma would do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. They used to do Shape Note singing. I would go to their church sometimes. And they'd be going like, you know, this and stuff. It's not good to listen to, but it's really fun to do. It was cool. Like, at that age, you know, I didn't appreciate anything, yeah. really. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like, there was a fair bit. You know, that was, had died out somewhat. There are, people still are somewhat religious down there. Um, There's still shape down there. There still is. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, you know, there was a couple movies, and, you know, there's small revivals of it um, sometimes. But uh, I went. I like going to the black churches. That's where when I went to church, that's where I went. The music, they like out. you could go down Eastern North Carolina, and there'd be like the best, some of the best music you ever heard in the Hardy's parking lot or something like that. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the because um, you know those women mostly could just seem like crazy. If it was like first African Zionist something, you knew the music was good. <laughs> so that's yeah. Any other questions? That's a different speech, though. Or whatever. <laughs>
Yeah. It's a different presentation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I have a, one story. So and I've told Judy this story. So I got a hand-me-down guitar from my brother when I was about 11, and uh, nylon string guitar. And you mentioned the Ballad of Jesse James. So the first song I ever performed was uh, my first gig, which was in a nursing home when I was 11 years old. And I sang Jesse James. <laughs> and, uh, Ooh. So I think people really liked it. I'm sure they did. <laughs> I bet your mom told you they did. Soul to it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he's a bad dude. <laughs> Very few songs about like accountants and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, like the nice guy. <laughs> Friend zone. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should write one. Friend zone. I'll give you that. Okay, good one. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, I appreciate everybody coming. Yeah, this yeah. Great yeah it's great. Thank you so much. <laughs>